<laughs> look, I just think that's a really great point. I wanted to um, ask you, Will, though, before we moved on any further. So you've read a lot of this stuff. You've seen both sides of it. Um, do you think that I've been too dogmatic against cross-racial casting? Like, um, certainly there's there's a whole audience of people out there who looked at my writing on the subject and thought, like, okay, this guy is, like, you know, insane. Um, but just as someone who knows comics, are we ever going to get to a point where not even just the the, the Disney and, and Warner Brothers characters of color get more screen time. You know, the, the Cassandra Keynes of the world, the a Jason Rush or a Miles Morales. But are we ever going to see a point where they lead into something better? I mean, I guess the, the real hope that I think we all share is the hope that we can tell authentic stories like Super Justice Force on the big screen just like everything else. And there's a very harsh reality that we're looking at right now. I mean, I wish that Oprah and Tyler Perry could get together and put, like, $60 million toward, like, telling a story like Super Justice Force or Watson and Holmes, something like that. Um, as of yet, they haven't. I guess there are too many single moms out there to please so far. But I guess, you know, the, the truth here is I want to see good comic media in public as well involving people who look like me. And I just don't have much... Uh, Respect is too strong, but I don't think I have much of a, a belief that we'll get there even with the characters that, you know, Warner Brothers and Disney already have. So can you do us a favor and talk a little bit more about what you think about the overall cross-racial casting thing and then lead into um, the best way we can actually inject diversity into some of these superhero comics? Oh, the cross-racial casting thing... When it comes to comics and comic movies, I've just shifted to a mentality of just be easy because it, it's going to pass, you know. None of this stuff lasts forever. There'll be another reboot or there'll be another, like, you can't take any of this stuff too seriously. That's ultimately where I am. Um, as far as it gaining any traction to making things better, I think Miles Morales was a good st- step in that direction. I know a lot of people just saw it kind of as a gimmick, but his version of Ultimate Spider-Man brought something different to a concept that had kind of gotten stagnant. And I feel that you do get a lot of... It's not just that Peter Parker's black now. You actually deal with a black Spider-Man who has the issues that go along with that and the upbringing and the, I don't know, I think it has opened some doors. I know a lot of people would say that Milestone Media opened some doors, but when you look at it, really it helps some careers, but those characters haven't gone anywhere except for static. So I really don't know if you can, that was almost like lightning in a bottle. But in terms of where things are headed now, I think you are going to get a lot of things that people might consider quote-unquote tokenism or might consider a gimmick. But you just have to, I don't know, keep throwing things at a wall to see what sticks. And in my mind, the Miles Morales situation has been the most successful. Because I'm a huge Miles Morales fan. Um, the only comic I read on a regular basis is Ultimate Spider-Man. Um, and in full disclosure, I'm actually pretty good friends with Brian Bendis. So, you know, him and I talk about this a lot. And, and to him, it's a combination of things. It's, it's, not, it's not a gimmick, and it wasn't a gimmick. And, and the reason he created Miles Morales was within a construct that allowed him to do what he both wanted to do and what he felt needed to be done. And that and what he felt needed to be done was to bring greater diversity to you know the Marvel universe or to the ultimate universe we used to say um, and try to have it be a, a, as authentic as it can be. And and again, I love that book. Um, I would have loved to have seen, you know, a whole new completely original character created other than a new Spider-Man. But the fact of the matter is Spider-Man's my favorite superhero. And what Brian's writing 
with Miles Morales is far more compelling than anything that I'm not going to name any of the other names that are currently writing other Spider-Man titles in what we'll call Marvel proper, you know. Um, and and again, he he, you know, for me that reinvigorated it. I mean, I was 12 years old thinking, man, it would be cool if Spider-Man was black. I mean, I, I've been you know into Spider-Man since I was younger than that, but at some point it dawned on me. This is what I'm missing. I want Spider-Man, and I want him to be black. And so it still took 30-something years for me to get that. But I got it, and I'm happy with it now. Because, honestly, I think that, you know, I, I talked to Brian the other day, and, and we were talking about comics, and, you know, I told him I really don't have much desire to write for Marvel. I've got a couple characters I love. I said, but when you're done with Miles, I want him. You know, and he just kind of laughed. He's like, he's never going to be done with Miles. I mean, he... He loves that, uh, you know, and I don't want to speak for him, but I, I believe that he loves Miles more than he loved Peter Parker. I really do believe that. So um, I want to ask a couple questions uh, at this point about, since we've already sort of, uh, I want to lead us toward this point in it, um, getting away from cross-racial casting and more into the comic media itself. The best way to get at that diversity. You both have spoken like really favorably about Miles Morales as a character and the kind of labor of love it is taken to sort of from uh, Mr. Bendis to get us to a point where we have this sort of you know free thinking, very you know useful, fun to read um, uh, character of color in a in a major book. I guess my question, starting off for this part of it, is. The coolness factor at 12, like, David, you spoke about this a little bit, about, you know, being 12 years old, reading Spider-Man, one thing, hey, it'd be really cool if he was black. There's a great point at the beginning of Secret Identities, I brought props, um, <laughs> where you have a guy, Jeff Yang, basically writing his reasons for wanting to do this book. And, I mean, you should take a look at it. This, this, this thing is online. But the important point here is that as a kid, he's really into reading, you know, the X-Men, done in a very, like, you know, racially inflammatory way here. Uh, and he ends up playing with other kids, and they decide to play superheroes. And one of them wants to be, you know, uh, you know Batman throwing batarangs, the other Spider-Man, and someone else is, you know, the thing or whatever. And then when Jeff, as a bespectacled, bowl-cut, you know, having, you know, young Chinese boy, says that he wants to be uh, Superman, all the other kids, who, none of whom are Asian, kind of laugh at him and say, no, you can't be Superman. You can be Shang-Chi. You know, you can use some martial arts, but you, it wasn't in their mental world that an Asian boy, a Chinese boy, could be Superman. The reason I bring up that story is... It's kind of a horrible sort of gut-wrenching thing. They told a little boy he couldn't be Superman. That ain't right. But at 12, I never had that experience. There wasn't a point when I was reading Superman comics or Batman comics where I thought, you know, it would be really cool if these guys were black. I always knew Superman and Batman and Spider-Man and Captain America and Thor. Those guys went to white neighborhoods. Gotham was like as white as a Friends episode. Like if 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 Batman actually existed, he would be considered a racist because he'd be spending all of his time beating up blacks and Latinos. Like let's just be facing it. It would be a, a criminal enterprise happening in an urban setting. We live in urban settings. There's some numbers to consider there. The, the the point I'm making is I never had that bit of wonder, and I think it's at the heart of why we want to see ourselves in comic media, why Miles Morales is so useful for both of you, wanting to see at 12 the black Spider-Man and now getting a chance to see it later in life is a really cool thing if the, the inciting incident ever happened to you. But I always knew these characters were white male power fantasies, so I think for me, there's a disconnect there that I don't really understand, and I, I kind of wonder as... All, if you could comment on that and also comment on if there have been any other characters in uh, mainstream superhero comics or even in indie stuff that got that sense of wonder to you by being a, a, a character of color. There are no black people living in Gotham. <laughs> <laughs> they got some sense and moved to Metropolis. No, I, I'm, I was like you where 
I never really wanted to see myself in comics. Like, I never saw myself in popular sort of franchises because I didn't necessarily gravitate towards the black one. Like, I didn't want to be Thundercat because I didn't want to be Panthro or Silverhawks. The black one is named Hotwing, for God's sake. So, like, I didn't want to be that either. So reading comics, I mean, I started when I was like let's say 11, and I honestly loved Robin. I loved Robin more than Batman because it was Tim Drake, but I never necessarily wanted to be him. I never saw myself in that world until Miles came along. And so he fulfilled something that I didn't know that I was missing. It sort of changed my perspective on comics. And it was a good feeling, but, like, I don't know if I'm still looking for that. It didn't start a hunger, per se. It just sort of, I'm satisfied. I don't want to rock the boat. Like, I like what I've got, and I'm good with it. Um, yeah, for me, it's that hunger's never gone away. Um and and I guess that's what drives a lot of the stuff that I create now. Um, I'm writing the sequel to Super Justice Force, and when I wrote Super Justice Force, I wrote that for me at 12, you know, at 13 years old. I mean, I remember the the first book that really changed my life was Fahrenheit 451, um, and 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 that was the first book that I, I recall reading that I felt like. Ray Bradbury had written it for me, you know, I was probably about 13 when I read it, because I, I understood that whole feeling of, like, being, you know, like, everyone's out to get me. I mean, I was a paranoid kid, you know. Um, I think that, like, I was always looking, I had a conversation about this with uh, Dwayne McDuffie years ago. You know, other than Spider-Man, my second favorite superhero was The Thing. And, and I felt like The Thing... I related to The Thing more than I related to uh, Spider-Man because The Thing was like Ben Grimm didn't fit in no matter where he went. And that's always how I felt like as, as, a, as a kid of color, as, you know, I felt like I did not fit in. I felt like people were putting up with me because they knew me, but if they had their choice, you know, I, I always felt like a bit of a monster, you know. And so... I was always desperately looking to make a connection, you know, in, in, in the worst, you know, maybe in the worst sort of ways. But I was, I was, I really wanted it. I wanted to see representations that look like myself. Um, and, and I don't know how old you guys are, um, but I've written about this at length. Because when I was a kid, you know, Good Times was on in first run. It wasn't even on in syndication. And, and when that was what was given to me, when, when JJ on Good Times, what was given to me, and that's what I'm supposed to relate to, it horrified me. You know, it was like that was, there was nobody in my world, you know, my family, my neighbors, there was nobody that was like JJ on Good Times. And yet that's what white people saw, that's what white people assumed that, that all people of color were like. Um, and so, so I, I definitely felt alienated. And so then I see this character in comics, you know, Ben Grimm, and he's alienated. And I was like, oh, yeah, well, he's practically black, you know. Spider-Man was, was you know, the, the whole concept of with great power comes great responsibility was a lot like how I was raised anyway. You know, I was raised in a, in a, in a, in a family that was like, you do more than is expected of you, even if you don't want to do it. Um, and so for me, my whole life was looking for characters I could relate to because the characters I was supposed to relate to, again, Good Times or the Jeffersons, was like, was, was like, those were like watching train wrecks every week. You know, it was like a horror show. One of the things I wanted to, to directly tackle next was the idea of what level of writing specificity, complexity is necessary to really convey a, a, an authentic connection about race or gender, minority status, identity, politics, what have you, to the reader. Um, just now, David, when you were talking about not wanting to see J.J. on Good Times, you know, everywhere you went in pop culture, and being able to identify with The Thing or Spider-Man because of that, I think that's really telling. But I also want to ask you about, in particular, 
you've written comic books, you're, you know, you've studied comic books. What level of writing complexity do we need to really go after the idea of the authentic black superhero? I bring this up in part because of, you know, you reference, uh, this, you know, the late, you know, great Dwayne McDuffie. I had a chance to read Icon basically in the last, like, three months. Um, I didn't, I, through the 90s, I was not exposed to Icon at all. I, I wish I had been. Because going back and reading it now, I look at it and it's a very much a 90s comic book in, in, in what that means. But that first run is just chock full of all manner of specific cultural references to the African-American political experience. I mean, you're getting Augustus Freeman IV, black conservative lawyer. I mean, I understand why uh, Justice Clarence Thomas was a fan. I get it now. Like, there's a really telling moment near the end of, like, the first or second issue where his, you know, new sidekick, Rocket, uh, a girl from the projects, as it were, like, starts off their collaboration reading a quote from W.B. Du Bois. And, and then Icon responds with, I've always been a Booker T. Washington, you know, man myself. And I go, oh, my God, this is awesome. Because if you're like me and you've studied black politics all your life, they are the divide. They are the, you know, up from bootstraps conservatism versus let's force the wider American community to deal with us as equal liberalism. And to have that divide as the centerpiece of the icon rocket collaboration, I thought was just brilliant writing. But other times when you look at minorities in comic books, you don't get that. And uh, this is the, the downside that's going to get me in trouble, I guess. But that's what Secret Identities was for me. It's filled with a lot of very simplistic, like two or three page vignettes, really, about Asian American superheroes that never really get the writing past a very elementary point. I mean, if there's any real downside to this book, is that the writing is just plain simple. Sorry, it is. And I often find that these characters, for all their utility as interesting characters, is, that utility gets hampered by the lack of cultural specificity, uh, actual Asian-ness or asian Americanness that comes to the pages. So I guess my, my question to you guys is, do we need to see writing as, like, referential and as dense as, say, an Alan Moore piece, like, from hell, in order to get an authentic black, Asian, gay, Latino, et cetera, superhero? Or can we, or is there a happy medium where we're not, like, overthrowing the, the reader's brains with, you know, here's what you need to know about black culture in order to get this book? But I think it also comes down to what is the black experience, and that's different for different people. I mean, I'm the quintessential, I'm whiter than you, I'm blacker than you are, is what white kids always tell me, and we all have a good laugh. <laughs> because, like, I grew up reading hardware, and that wasn't really my experience. Hardware was it was kind of like Mantis meets Steel. And I, I've said that to Joe Illich, and he kind of told me I need to read it again because I certainly didn't grasp it the way I was supposed to. But that wasn't my experience, you know? So even though Miles isn't necessarily my experience, I can kind of gravitate towards what's going on with him. But I think you have to make sure you have an inclusive black experience, you know, if that makes any sense. That's kind of my – so I don't know what level of writing because that the the icon that you just mentioned seemed like a very specific type of writing, and that wouldn't necessarily encompass the entire black experience to be a quote-unquote black superhero. Yeah, you know, I wrote a, a comic years ago that never – nothing happened with it. I um, I could not find a publisher interested in it that – that I felt really addressed it, addressed a lot of a lot of the issues, um, the the double consciousness that that Du Bois talked about, um, really got into the concept of and and set within the world of superheroes. So he it was about a guy who was forever the sidekick, but he was actually the team leader, you know. But the whole world viewed him as the sidekick, 
And it was, and I wrote this close to 10 years ago, so I was a little bit angrier back then. And, um, and I, you know, I showed it to some, some editors and some publishers, and they were, they all said, wow, this is an amazing thing. I've never seen a story like this. This is new and fresh and original. We're not going to go near it. You know, I mean, the comics industry in and of itself, even when it appears that it's taking chances, and when we're talking the comic industry, let's be honest, we're always talking about Warner Brothers and now Disney. You know, we're talking about their, their, their two entities that they own. Um, they don't take big chances. Even when it seems like they're taking a big chance, it's, it's either calculated risk that they know is a loss leader, right? You know, they, they don't mind losing a little bit of money because they know they're going to make it up somewhere else along the way. Um, and I don't know how to, I, I only know how to write what's authentic to me. And, and, to, and, 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 you know, and then everything else I'm just making up. And, you know, it's like, I'm hoping it sticks to the wall. You know, I, I, I have, um, characters in, in my book that, you know, um, I think they, they seem real, but then I don't know for sure. Um, and as I'm working on the sequel, I'm dealing with some of that too. And, and, and I have these issues with a character in the new book who's um, who's Native American, and um, and 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 so it becomes you know I made this conscious decision I'm going I'm simply writing him as someone who grew up in a, a, a in in poverty, but I'm not going to try to write him as Tonto or any other Native American that we usually think of in popular culture. So him no speak like this you know and he doesn't say things like my people have a way. There's, you know, I reveal that he, he grew up in North Dakota, I grew up, uh, that he grew up poor, that he grew up wanting more, but, like, what I tend to do is I will try to look at all the worst stereotypes you can see in, in popular culture of people of color, and I go, okay, either don't go near there, or try to find a way to, to turn that stereotype around, to give it a different twist. And that's what I think, that that's the closest, you know, I'm just not smart enough and talented enough to do anything other than that, is to try to avoid the worst stereotype, you know? I guess on, on the last, like, more or less point that I wanted to make sure we got a chance to discuss on this. Um, so Marvel's introduced Kamala Khan as a, the new Miss Marvel, and I've had a chance to read the first issue. Uh, I don't know if you guys have been you know, exposed to it, but... I really hated it. <laughs> and the reason being, I felt like I'd read the story before. She's, in essence, Peter Parker with brown boots. Like that's, that's, that's what it is. It's, it's, if you take, it's even down to the point where her main antagonist is basically a gender-bent Flash Thompson. And you have this whole mean girl aspect that replaces the, the previous jock versus nerd aspect in, in the old Spider-Man stuff. The reason I bring Kamala Khan up is there's been a lot of conversation about what Kamala Khan means, supporting this book, getting a chance to see this particular identity wrought through comics. And again, I think a lot of that is racial tribalism just, you know, among minority comics fans. But what I'm kind of concerned about is this idea that when we are trying to talk about what's an authentic character, there's almost no way, no mechanism, no paradigm by which Warner Brothers and Disney can effectively deliver that to the audience. And I think, David, you were sort of speaking a lot about this. I'm kind of shocked. You write a great black superhero, and they say, wow, this is amazing. This is great. We won't touch it. Like, I can't feel confident that these are the people for whom – the big name, everybody knows it, popular culture, like superhero properties of color, there is their stuff, so they're entrusted with that idea. And by doing so, by leaving that uh, in their trust, we all collectively allow people who don't really want to speak to us as people of color, as women, as homosexuals, etc. cetera. Uh, we're allowing these mainstream conglomerates to define us for us. And I kind of want to know if there's been any characters. I, I, when you guys were talking about this, I was thinking of all the Jason Rushes of the world who he gets introduced, and within six uh, issues, he's in a, in a full-page you know, panel in a chicken suit. 
and that's supposed to be okay, and that's supposed to not remind me of Mantan Moreland or people like that. You see Civil War, where in the, in the flagship, Joe Quesada, I believe, on like the, the Colbert Report, talking about this major league event that you have to read about from Marvel Comics, and within like Civil War number five, near the end of it, after Captain America gets his ass handed to him by Tony Stark, suddenly he's all upset, Luke Cage is offering another way of looking at things in this quiet cage. I'm thinking, you have no rights or a voice that a white man's supposed to respect, don't you know? Obviously, the rest of that is my little addition to that comment, but quiet cage, I'm thinking, said that to me. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of allowing the, the conglomerates to set for us what we're supposed to be like in comic media, and I'm wondering if there's any way around that. Uh, Jen Fang, writing at Reappropriate, uh, my girlfriend, uh, wrote about Grace Choi from The Outsiders before the New 52, written by Judd Winnick, being a great example of a minority superhero for whom she could relate. Now, she's not Thai. She's, you know, Taiwanese Canadian, actually. Uh, but, but for Jen... The idea of Grace Choi was someone who was strong, was powerful, she was Asian, she was, like, all these things, you know, lesbian. But these were all bits and pieces of an overall coherent whole. And I'm kind of thinking through my knowledge of superheroes of color, especially the ones from the conglomerates, and it, I don't come to many of them who can appeal to that in any way. Cassandra Kane was a moot... Uh, martial artist, and that's all she was. Uh, I told you about Jason Rush, I mean, and the list goes on. I mean, hell, there's a panel with, like, Black Lightning talking to Mr. Terrific, and the most they can say to each other is, like, I want to let everybody know I was here. That's why I call myself Black Lightning. Negro, we know what you look like. I mean, like, it, it, it makes no sense. So, soapbox over. I just, last thing, is there a possible mechanism by which the conglomerates can actually do a superhero of color well? If Miles Morales is the only example of this, what does that mean for the industry? Do they want to do it well is the question. Because, I mean, I ultimately think you can do it with someone like Grace Choi because it was the outsiders. You know, you ain't going to get anybody on a lunchbox. <laughs> who's de this depiction that you want. We've talked about it before that licensing is the best slash worst thing for the industry because Batman will always be Bruce Wayne. Spider-Man will always be Peter Parker. They may change some stuff in the comics every now and then, but it's because the man on the street who buys underoos and lunchboxes know that quintessential information. So I think you can do it on the fringe with characters who quote-unquote don't matter like a grace, but I don't know if you'll ever see it done with a flagship character or if you'll ever see a character from the fringe promoted to flagship. I mean, they've kind of tried to do it with Cyborg with the new 52. He's got a higher profile, but what have they really done with that? And I mean, they've kind of done it with Vibe, but... <laughs> It's vibe. So, I mean, really, what do we expect to happen? I think you can do that again on the fringe with those sort of lesser-tiered characters, but I don't know if you're ever going to have a big leaguer who meets your expectations. I think um, this is a difficult thing to say. But uh, with each passing day, I'm becoming less and less concerned about, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm going to go see Captain America when it comes out, right? I'll probably go see Amazing Spider-Man 2 when it comes out. I'll go see The Avengers 2. I'll go see all of these movies. I, they, they, they appeal to parts of me, but I'm getting to the point where I don't care about them anymore, to the point that I don't need to give them, I don't need to post their, 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 their I don't need to be their, their, their PR anymore. And, and, and I'm not looking for... You know, my days of looking, whether it's Marvel or Disney, whether it's DC or Warner Brothers, my day of looking for those entities, those corporate entities to deliver to me what I need or want, they're over. You know, I'm looking towards the independence, and I feel that, like, there is an opportunity within independent comics, just like within independent film, for people to find a level of success and change the game. 
When I was a kid growing up, there was three networks. You know what I'm saying? Now the, the possibilities are endless. We, we change how we define success, and then what we do is we become successful. You know, and, and that's what it is. It's, 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 I, I, I don't need, um, I don't need a major studio. I don't need Will Smith or Jaden Smith to option my novel and turn it into a movie for me to be successful. What I need for my novel to be successful is for people to read it and enjoy it. And in order for people to read it and enjoy it, what I need is, is, is more word of mouth, more grassroots, more people spreading the word. And that's what I'm working towards. That's the goal that I'm trying to achieve. And, and I think, you know, we're, you know, as a people, as black folks, we get so upset because, you know, we're looking to be delivered and we, we never get delivered. It's not going to happen. You know, America has, has its place for us and, if we're not comfortable with it, then we do have to work to change it. And it's not that easy. I mean, it's, 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 some people say I sound too conservative when I say that. Some people say I sound too militant when I say that. But the reality is, is that, um, this, what, just cause we want it to be a way, just cause it should be a way, don't mean it's gonna happen. We have to make it for ourselves. Well, no, hey, I appreciate it. I appreciate the up from slavery Booker T. Washington you know, inflection there. I think that I think you're right in a lot of that, and that's kind of ultimately the reason why I've been so dogmatic against the cross racial casting and some of these other characters of color that I just find reprehensible. I, I mean, there's something to be said for finding more in the independent realm, and certainly over the last few years, that's been more my thing, but I think, for me anyway, a huge part of the problem was that I just wasn't exposed to it. I didn't know that Milestone, uh, Miles, I'm not saying that right, uh, existed. I didn't know it was there until it was over. Like, I mean, that, that was my experience. I was reading comics in trades for a long time, and you know, I, I got into high school, and then suddenly, like, Someone's like, hey, did you know there were these black superheroes out there? And I was like, no. And I felt like an idiot. I felt like there was something that I should have been able to grow up with that I just wasn't exposed to. And I think that's been, I mean, one of the reasons that I, you know, went off to the Schomburg that day was to find out more about independent comic creators. I mean, I, I found out about a lot of folks that I just didn't know existed. And, and I guess that's the overall part of it to me. I want us as, you know, blurs who are interested in comics, let's say, it's fine if we're interested in, like, the mainstream stuff, too. I'm not discounting that. Um, I, I bit torn a lot of it, honestly. <laughs> but, but, you know, that's not exactly helpful for the industry, either. Uh, I would much rather, though, we were able to say, hey, here's this great new black actress. Here's this great new actor. Let's find a way to get those people with the Oprahs and Tyler Perry's and, and Force Whitaker's of the world, and let's make a, a a comic book movie about us with us. You know, maybe we don't necessarily need much more than studio backing uh, and a good story. Uh, we can find those good stories in independent media, and it just doesn't at all jive to me that we say, hey, you know, Marvel's doing a new TV show. Let's have them make that character one of us so we can feel good about watching it or, or whatever that even means now. Like, I would much rather we were able to focus on ourselves like the rest of you would. Um, I just never see how the the big two characters, you know, the big two conglomerates get us to that point. And, yes, we shouldn't look for those people for validation. I totally agree with that. But I don't understand how asking them to cross racial cross-racially cast their own properties to include diversity that looks like us isn't asking them for validation. I think at one point I said it wasn't like using the tools to, to, to take down the master's house. It was like Rick James like sit, putting his muddy black boots all over the master's couch. Like I think that's, that's the difference. That's what cross-racial casting does. That's what paying for Vibe, <laughs> I don't think anyone paid for Vibe, but I'm just saying that's what, you know, supporting some of these properties ends up forcing us to do as people of color, and I'm, it's still an open-ended question to me whether or not that's ethical. So, if I haven't sucked all the air out of the room, I think we've come to the end of our conversation. I want to thank David Walker. 
I want to thank Will West. Uh, you guys have been absolutely amazing setting this up with me, and I really I cannot thank you guys enough for putting up with all my various questions and my inflammatory language. Uh, you've been very kind, so thank you both for your help today. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you, and and I don't disagree with anything you're saying, so it's not that inflammatory. It's just um, you sound like I did like like ten years ago, fifteen years ago. Now I feel like like Danny Glover in in, in um, oh, those I hate those movies. I can't even think what they're called. The Lethal Weapon movies, where I'm just I'm just too old for this. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my good! Well, well, thank you for the compliment. Because <laughs> if, if, if I sound like you, I'm in really good company. Hey, guys out there, please get a chance to you know, share this video with your friends and family and anyone interested in comics. But make sure, more importantly, that you get a chance to go to a couple of websites. That's WilliamBruceWest.com and Badass Mofo. I want you to spell that URL for the people at home. It's uh, B-A-D-A-Z-Z-M-O. F-O dot com. And if it, and because I don't have the little thing written along the bottom because I couldn't figure out how to do that. When in doubt, just go to the David Walker site, all one word, dot com. That'll take you everywhere. That's a portal to everything. There you go. There you go. Badass mofo. That's a black ass URL. You know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks again, fellas, and uh, have a good time out there. Peace.